Right. Good afternoon. My name is Meg Ray. I'm the Science and Technology Librarian here at Portland Public Library. And I'm here to welcome you to Portland's Sustainability Series. We meet here every fourth Wednesday of the month at 5.30 for a presentation and conversation about various sustainability-related topics in our community. And we're very fortunate because this series is actually a partnership between the library and Southern Maine Conservation Collaborative, which is a fantastic organization that assists work in Cumberland, Cumberland County conservation organizations oof, to acquire, manage, and steward land in our communities. So I'm going to turn the mic over to Jess, who is the executive director, and she will introduce today's speaker. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Jessica Burton with the Southern Maine Conservation Collaborative, and our uh, organization works with 21 conservation organizations in Southern Maine, and we really think together about how to increase all of our impact through joint programming and um, building partnerships and connections to our community. And this is a wonderful example, the sustainable Sustainability Series. We have to practice that word, I think. Um, with the library, it's a perfect partnership. Uh, and it's been, now, uh, August will be our 12th event, so we've had one every single month um, since August of 2016, and it's really been a fantastic series. Um, tonight, we're very fortunate to have our speaker, Lawrence Mott, um, who has incredible experience working in the renewable energy field for over 30 years, so has a breadth of experiences and travels all over the world. I live next door to him on Peaks Island, so I see him come and go from all the various places, and it's uh, very exciting, and we're really fortunate. So, thank you, Lawrence, and thank all of you for coming tonight. Thank you both. It's fun to be uh, at the library in this facility, and I see we've got a super small crowd, so uh, dash in, interrupt, ask questions. Uh, because we've got an opportunity to be uh, interactive. A um, couple of quick questions. Everybody local, what's, uh, um, are you coming from uh, afar? You've been here long? Give me a few things. Portland. 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 All right. So I go. Your county. Good. So it's a local effort and um, any interesting projects from this young man you've been thinking about renewable energy you want me to hit on? All right. Um, I'm going to go fast and uh, slow. Uh, call out if a point is not there. I make it a habit to try to give some background to where I'm coming from, my perspective uh, as a speaker and uh, engineering and business degree. Uh, spend a lot of time in the industry, as just mentioned, American Wind Energy Association. Uh, I spent 30 some years in Vermont, uh, chairman of a trade group, Renewable Energy Vermont, focused on promoting renewable energy. So from my uh, basis of building a wind turbine as a college uh, project, I've always gone forth that the idea is we need to bring money in, classic economics and build renewable energy for all of its value and that it should make sense on a pure economic basis. So that's been my life work in industry right in the thick of it um, through all these various companies and uh, through those efforts. Um, I, if you wanted to classify, even though you can have a perspective of uh, some politics, because this is just Vermont. That is a normal scene in Vermont with Senator Welch, Sanders, and uh, uh, Patrick Leahy. Um, it is, as I say, uh, probably socially liberal, but very fiscally conservative. And I'm bringing this up because people consider renewable energy, they talk about tax credits, subsidies, and other things. And I really want to dispel some of the notions of why renewable energy is absolute grounded uh, basic economics of why we should be doing it. A uh, few announcements. Remember, energy efficiency first. Don't go running after generation. Start where you should at the beginning. Uh, uh, we get lost in this sometimes. People think about new, new generation, new ideas. Uh, we really want to think about it. Uh, I really like Amory Levin's comment. Notice uh, we get so wrapped up in technology or a specific type of refrigerator. 
Well, in northern Maine, your most effective might actually be going back to an ice house, um, and that's still going to keep your beer cold. So let's think about uh, what you want. Uh, an announcement, just because we do get in our new polarized political world, people get into scare tactics. So I'd like to, I bring this out. Um, we've got lots of energy. And I think the points there are pretty clear on uh, where the trouble is. A little bit about uh, the company I work for and an example of the topic tonight of what's going on in our industry. Um, my company that I've been working with for the last seven years here in Portland uh, has now been fully acquired by Wood Group. And Wood Group is a $5 billion Scottish oil services company uh, in, uh, I think they have 96 offices worldwide. So here we are as a uh, small renewable energy uh, technical advisory group. And now we've finally been fully acquired uh, by a 35,000 employee group. So the Wood Group uh, has all these possibilities of pipeline services, operations and maintenance, <coughs> industrial services, the whole kit. And uh, this is what's going on in the renewable energy industry right now. It's hit the money, it's hit the big business, and so big businesses are coming in and looking for the companies that they feel they can make money from, that they can grow and they can uh, uh, bring into there. Clearly an oil company right now suffering uh, publicly traded with stock price volatility based on what a barrel of oil is and what the politics of OPIC or other issues. They're very excited about renewable energy because they see uh, the growth, they see the stability. I'll tell you in about uh, five or six years if it's going to work or not. Uh, so now, um, just following on that point, is here's a massive $5 billion company, and we live under a specialized technical solutions in the clean energy group. And of course, when the marketers said, we're going to be called Wood Group Clean Energy, I kind of wondered, well, what do you call the rest of the company? Um, I'm going to keep, uh, I think, still with Skur Energy. Skur is a Scottish uh, firm, so my company based in Glasgow uh, with uh, our 320 people around the world. Um, our focus is being an independent engineer. So we're purely an engineering firm, and we focus on providing advice in the renewable energy field. We spend most of our time uh, providing technical advisory to the financial community. So a classic example is our customer is a equity investor on Park Avenue in New York City who wants to build a $400 million wind farm in Texas. They come to us to make sure that all the contracts with the wind turbine supplier, the soil conditions, power purchase agreements, all the pieces of this puzzle are in order and the right deal and they move forward. So that's uh, our work as engineers working within the financial community. We spent a lot of time trying to get answers to questions. As you can imagine in the renewable energy field, our fuel is the natural resource, whether it's the sun or the wind. So we have developed various tools in order to get a better idea of the energy resource. Um, in the case of wind power, the energy coming out of a wind turbine is a cubic function of the resource. So just a tiny change in the actual wind speed is a uh, cubic change in the actual energy output. So uh, a lot of the wind farms we work on uh, might be generating $25,000 of electricity per hour in value. So you can imagine uh, a small change in that if you could get it to $29,000 an hour, uh, or in the case of operations and maintenance, if that machine, that wind farm is offline for a day, um, you can, uh, the investors get a little nervous. We do a lot of work in offshore wind power. Um, we have a control center, it's a remote operations center to monitor all these projects to keep them on track. There's our offices around the world and we're lucky enough to have one of them in Portland, Maine. And now under our new wood group, we have offices uh, even farther afield. So. Um, let's talk about tonight. Uh, I want to hit on some electric generation, uh, wind, solar, 
really hitting on costs, what's going on around the world. Uh, storage is a big topic, I have a feeling uh, people are interested in. Um, so let's uh, move through those. I use this graph often because it helps give an understanding. So the two things you're looking at, two axes. First of all, you're looking at the technology stage. Is it embryonic and how well developed? You can see that uh, large hydro nuclear, this has been around for a long time. This is a mature and actually in the case of nuclear is an aging technology. You're not seeing a lot of new uh, installations in this area. The next axis is where do we get our electricity generation from, primarily in Canada, United States, Mexico. Well, this is where you're getting the bulk of your energy. You're not getting much from these new technologies. So uh, the king of the heap right now in our country is natural gas. It's the cheapest, it's the most flexible, it's cheap to build, uh, it's very popular, it's like a drug. And uh, we currently in this country have the cheapest natural gas in the world by far. Uh, and with the uh, shale uh, gas and uh, fracking, it's just continued to keep the price down low. So everyone is going towards the ability to build a cheap natural gas plant uh, I'm going to touch on some of these other things through, but I want you to just keep in mind, this is the big base load power. Uh, we really don't generate electricity with oil anymore. Uh, the only uh, point is really interesting because it's right next door. If you uh, go look out on uh, Cousins Island, that actually is an oil-fired uh, steam plant that's used for peaking. So it comes on and may run for five hours on a cold winter day and then shut down. Any questions on that? Just quickly, uh, terminology, I'll use kilowatt, megawatt, a lot of the big um, projects we speak of in megawatts to understand the size. Um, to just give you some context, a typical uh, house uh, around here in Maine might be using at any time about one kilowatt and we might have a peak when a pump's on and a stove's on and a bunch of other things at two or three kilowatts or you have a hot tub or something. Um, now you add time, so that means it's actually energy. So now uh, we look at our bill, kilowatt hours, and how many we use and what we have to pay for. Um, this is the installed capacity. Uh, that plant on Cousins Island is about uh, 600 kW, uh, 600 megawatts, pardon me. And uh, a big wind turbine we'll see might be three megawatts. Capacity factor, that's a measure of, um, if a, you had a 100% capacity factor, that would mean that the machine was running 100% of the time all day long. So if your car you had running 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, um, tearing down the highway, that would be 100%. Um, and that's an important thing to think about. If To use your car example, you probably only use, have a capacity factor of your car of probably 10%. Um, if you're a busy driver, maybe even less. Uh, if you own an asset, in the case of a generation plant, what do you want? You want to make sure that that's running as much as possible. Uh, availability, uh, that's simply saying, is it green light, go, it's not broken, it's ready to go. Um, I emphasize some of the things because the fossil fuel generation industry, the, the uh, conventional fuels versus renewable, they like to point fingers and say, Renewable energy is intermittent, doesn't work, you can't integrate it. Uh, and I want to just, again, hit on some of these points is of being intermittent. We measure our uh, two resources. We talk about the annual average wind speed and sun hours. Uh, so to give you an example, here we have sun hours resources about three. Uh, sun hours, uh, and New Mexico is about eight. Germany is about three, 3.1. So let's talk about wind power a little bit. Um, this is a, a project out in uh, Utah. Those are uh, 100 meter towers. So 100 meters from the ground to the turbine, and the rotors tip to tip are 100 meters. Typical wind turbine. Pretty obvious, that's why it's really great, because they're simple. Uh, rotor, generator, there's a disc brake, just like your car, to uh, stop it. And uh, 
you can also pitch the blades just like an airplane in order to change the uh, power uh, characteristics and then at the bottom of the machine nowadays you have uh, power converters, inverters and all the pieces to um, uh, convert it to stable electricity. I'm going to move through, I don't expect there's no quizzes um, but if you're interested I'm glad to, to uh, hit on this at the end of the talk but we are very interested as I said in the power of the wind um, and what you are f able to extract from that air which is kinetic energy passing through the rotor plane so this is just like a big barn door uh, when the blades are rotating and that's what uh, is pushing through the rotor and you're capturing it ideally you'd have a really big rotor and you'd capture as much of that wind as possible which would give you more energy but then where we live if you've got a hurricane or a storm then you're going to have to design that wind turbine to stand up in those storm conditions so we have a lot of different classes of wind turbines depending on where you put them we put a, a wind turbine on the south pole in the Antarctica uh, in Antarctica because uh, and in that case the difficulties are a the temperature negative 100 degrees but the other one is really great in that the highest wind speed ever recorded there is about uh, 25 miles an hour so you could put a very big rotor there and not worry about it uh, blowing over and it was also uh, an ice foundation so we uh, excavated cut dug out and put a metal foundation in and then used some uh, heat and then we refroze it because it's always frozen um, and then you had an ice foundation so you used local material uh, just to hit on some of this this is the uh, worldwide energy resource in the case of wind and the darker is the uh, windier uh, resource we talk about the roaring 40s and the 40s latitudes if any sailors here and uh, all the winds and waves there uh, and then some more here and then you can see it's all white uh, in the uh, uh, Arctic and Antarctic regions. Solar. Uh, this is just on the western side of Denali in Alaska. It's a small village of about 30 people. It's one of my colleagues uh, uh, kneeling with the local uh, uh, Inuvit uh, kids uh, there and uh, they were running diesel generators. So solar is a wonderful opportunity in that uh, they could shut the generators off basically in the end of April uh, with the sun in Alaska at those northern latitudes and basically run on solar all the way through until um, end of October. Photovoltaics, a good example of why we have uh, government agencies such as NASA and DOE that work on technology in the 1950s uh, for space exploration in that case and brings a useful technology that we use every day now and can continue to profit from. Uh, Simply put a uh, semiconductor uh, material which has different uh, ion properties, positive and negative. When you put the uh, sunlight and get the photons of the sunlight on it, you'll get some motion and it basically pushes electrons off and you can start a circuit so that the circuit flows plus towards minus and in around and you can get a direct current, DC current. So photovoltaic panels generate DC current and uh, then we can just put masses of, of them together and we can build a power plant. I talked about resource, just an interesting uh, fact of uh, the concentration of solar uh, from our sun uh, in our country and what you could do uh, to provide power in the country. So I wanted to hit on some costs and uh, the takeaway from this graph, I'm going to have about four or five, five slides here. Um, again, feel free to uh, dig in, ask questions. Uh, the point is where they're going. Solar and wind. All we do is, in this very short time period, continually watch the cost of this generation go down. So in this graph, this is focused on utility scale, not a few solar panels on your garage. But you can look at numbers uh, here in a case of rooftop so we're now approaching 2015 and this has gone down a little bit more we're in the uh, this is dollars per megawatt hour so if you converted that to cents because I think most of us think about uh, how many cents per kilowatt hour is your electricity that you pay for CMP right now is what about 12 cents 15 cents um, so this generation this wholesale generation cost is saying it's 5.8 to 7 cents 
for this generator at their wholesale big project can generate in a sunny region. So uh, some of the assumptions here is going to be back to that previous slide in the southwest where you've got a lot of sun. So in Maine, you're probably going to be up closer to uh, 70 to 80 or uh, 8, 9 cents, somewhere in there. Uh, we can talk further on some of the other slides on how do you get the basis of that. And I have to continue to, to emphasize this is for a big, massive project that might be 50, 100 megawatts in size uh, uh, in a desert application. Um, residential wise, I'd say we're right now, we're probably in Maine on a uh, side of a barn. We're probably somewhere in the range of uh, this number, uh, around 19 cents, so we're not far off. Um, the idea is the word grid parity. When does solar, in this case, become uh, the same as uh, the cost you'd buy for the utility? So if we are at 19 cents and you're paying retail 15, we're getting close. So a little bit more on that. Um, this is an updated uh, uh, graph. This one is 2016-17. Um, uh, Lazard I, is the entity I meant to reference. It's a European entity. Uh, a lot of the other um, graphs I have here are from Bloomberg. Um, so there's your, it's hard to read. I'm not sure how it easy it is to read from there, but uh, your solar uh, PV residential. Notice this is the 13, 8 cents to uh, 22 cents. And you can come down and look around at the various things. I think what's important is my point on uh, right here is the bottom one. Combined cycle gas. My point on fracking and this over uh, uh, push, look where their numbers are. So that's 4.8 cents to 7.8 cents um, on life cycle costs. So this is uh, a life cycle um, cost and in this basis is uh, all in. What are the interest costs, capital costs, operating costs, and pick a lifetime, let's say 20 years, and what would be your overall cost on that basis? So the, the big frustration with President Trump is that coal, by classic market economics, is really uh, not the cheapest. And so uh, we've had, if you look at uh, wind, here's wind, here's natural gas, here's some of these others. And you look at the uh, uh, mining, uh, side costs, the externalities of mining and storing coal and other concerns about you. Remember the, the uh, dam of ash let loose and went into that river two or three years ago? And the fact that it's really not such a great deal. Uh, so this is pure market economics, no politics involved. Um, that's why coal is not doing well. It has nothing about uh, the renewable energy business picking on coal or uh, uh, saying that uh, they shouldn't be in business. They're just simply not competitive. And that's the same goes for nuclear. I want to touch on a few of those points later. I, I have a question. The uh, gas combined cycle, um, is the gas peaking category not using combined cycle technology? Uh, it can't, it usually does. Why are the costs uh, so much higher? Because uh, it's a classic case of the business model. So you are paying to have that plant sit there on standby and do nothing. So it's reserve capacity. It's re reserve capacity. And it's possible in some cases that you'll have to see the natural gas uh, reciprocating uh, depending on where in the world you are, uh, whether it's diesel engine or a standard reciprocating engine, you may have that also. So just to kind of finish out uh, the point of this graph is emphasizing again, here's these big lines are showing that the actual cost of the technology, uh, life cycle cost of energy continuing to come down. And these bars are showing what's being installed. So this is um, a gigawatts. So now we've gone from kilowatts to megawatts to gigawatts. And we see this continued installation of Cumulative, uh, the dark blue is onshore wind and utility PV and then the uh, 
commercial PV, when a lot of uh, Home Depot, uh, uh, United Parcel, these folks, uh, Walmart, are putting photovoltaics on their roof. That's the commercial industrial. And then the next one, of course, would be residential. So here's the proof and the numbers of uh, the market responding to uh, the value. And you can see, uh, similar to those other numbers, we're in this uh, 5 to 10 cent range. And then higher on these uh, solar. I had a question about um, the previous slide, actually. Uh, in which you're showing that wind, uh, for instance, and solar are pretty low costs. Uh, but do you have any fact that takes into account the fact that they are intermittent and really have to be backed up at times by something like gas peaking? So it's really a combination of those two that you actually end up paying. Exactly. So, uh, perfect question. So, of course, this graph is, is simple. So this is simply stating uh, equally across every technology, uh, all its capital operating costs, cost of money, and therefore that's its generation cost. So then uh, your point is, if you want to have uh, stable power, then do you need to add a firming, might be the term, uh, source to this intermittent resource and based on those two together should be your blended price, uh, I believe is your point, which is a good one. And I would say the answer is yes, that's practical. Um, in the uh, trading and our current capitalist uh, system, we don't do that. It's everybody for everybody. We have an unregulated, for the most part, uh, utility sector. So what happens is there's an operator who's operating ISO New England, you might have heard. So they're a quasi-government entity and they're in charge of ensuring that the transmission system in our whole distribution network is operated safely and no one's left in the cold. And so they are running, if I may, the dials to say, what's the wind output? What's the solar output? How many air conditioners are gonna get turned on at one o'clock in the afternoon? And what resources? And they're just gonna pick and choose the cheapest resource and hope at the end of the day that their blended portfolio is going to be low cost and reliable. Uh, I had a great experience two weeks ago. I was in Curacao, which is in the, uh, down in the uh, Antilles near Venezuela in the Caribbean, commissioning a wind farm. So that island uh, is a big, fairly big island. They have 160 megawatts installed capacity of big uh, uh, oil fired and diesel plants. There's also an oil refinery that takes a lot of Venezuelan oil and refines it and ships it to Europe along with beautiful beaches. Um, the, uh, there are now four wind farms on the island. We just commissioned the fourth uh, there and the, I talked to the utility engineer as we were setting up what I just referred to as all the operator controls so that that utility operator could shut the wind farm down or curtail it back it down and other things. And he says, oh no, we consider the wind farm base load power. We just run it full bore all the time. We don't touch it. Now in the case of um, uh, Curacao, you know these, these things. You have the trade winds and they're very predictable. They know exactly that around four in the afternoon that wind's gonna come up and it's gonna stay right through 10, 11 o'clock at night. And then it's gonna come back down again. And uh, they're very comfortable with relying on that. So they call it base load power. And they're not worried about having spinning reserves uh, to make up for it. So uh, while I concur with your point, A, we don't deal with it in our current regulatory market. And B, um, we're finding more and more of the adaptations in the case of wind power. We're putting bigger rotors on. We're getting better capacity factor and uh, operators are getting very accustomed to what the characteristics are and uh, we're getting more and more penetration, we use the word, of renewable energy into the grid. And you're just gonna see more of it, especially with the advent of storage, which to your point would be another cost you'd wanna consider. Um, uh, little known fact uh, is that the demand, people turning their light switches on and off in coffee pots, varies much more than typical outputs of a whole conglomerate of wind farms and solar plants. So to the operators, they're finding the demand going up and down more than the uh, generation, the intermittent renewable source. I think this is an interesting graph. 
um, that was put together uh, on an uh, energy plan that uh, uh, Vermont put together uh, from a, a consultancy down in, in uh, Massachusetts. This was done probably, this is a while ago, it's a date, yeah, 2009. So the whole point was, um, what I want you to take away is the factor of development risk. So if you're a developer and you want to build a project and you're going to build a nuclear plant, the likelihood that you're actually going to get all of your permits, everything done and have a commercial plant, you can imagine that's where you score here. And even in a very difficult state like Vermont, because Vermont has a lot of uh, anti-wind people, um, you're still have quite a bit lower uh, risk. And then you can see that this is out of date now. This actually would change. These graphs would go like this. Um, but it just gives you some idea of a consideration, which is uh, nuclear is the only uh, technology right now in the United States that is uh, able to secure a United States federal loan guarantee because it's so high risk we in the renewable energy business call them spoiled brats because we, if we develop and we lose, we lose. But if they develop, the government will stand behind them and bail them out. So it's not fair economics um, uh, on that point. Why is that? Good lobbying. Uh, remember, it's all politics. We're going to hit more on politics. But uh, another uh, unknown point, the oil industry um, okay, let's talk about taxes. Keep it simple. So the renewable energy business uh, focused on wind and solar has what's called uh, investment tax credit. Some of you may have put solar panels on your roof and you've used a federal uh, tax credit. So right on your tax forms, if you, it says, did you install a renewable energy facility on your house this year? And you can get a 30% tax credit. So simply put, instead of sending uh, that money to Uncle Sam, if you show proof that you bought a renewable energy system, you can actually put that same money and prove to the government you put it into a renewable energy system, i.e. the installer sends a note, everything's set. So that is a subsidy, clear and free. Wind also has a production tax credit, um, but it's only based on production. So if your wind farm doesn't produce, you don't get a tax credit. And, and I call that pretty fair. It says you've got to work or else you don't get your deal. The oil business and the gas business, um, oh, let me finish. The renewable solar and wind, those are temporary. They get uh, voted on uh, and they've lasted from two years to now four years and now they're sunsetting, so they're done. The wind tax credit will end three more years, 2020, and it's over. The solar one, and by the way, the wind one is dropping down every year. The solar one continues for uh, four years and then it stops. So hurry up if you're going to do your solar panels on your roof. You've got uh, four years, get it done. Um, federal level or the state level? Federal level. Um, so to my point, oil and gas, they've written those into our laws permanently. They don't get voted on, they're buried in the legislation. That same type of tax credit exists. Uh, for oil and gas, but we don't hear about it because it's not voted on. It's not in the media. It's not out there. Um, but it's been going on since the 19, it was part of the 1950s coming back to really push oil exploration and the whole notion of the powerful United States uh, uh, economic engine. And they wanted to, to uh, uh, induce more uh, investment in that sector. We in the renewable energy business like to say we're glad to uh, participate on a level playing field. We will give up our production tax credit. No problem. Come take it away and we will compete just straight deal. Uh, but the oil and gas industry won't accept our challenge. Um, before I go, uh, I've been throwing around a lot of numbers. Uh, so right now in Texas is the largest uh, United States um, uh, state of, of um, wind activity big wind farms being built there. And those uh, wind farms are coming out at three and a half cents. So that number that I quoted there is for real. These are projects that we've been involved with uh, that they're generating on the bus bar at the end of that substation. And these are big projects, two, 300 megawatts. Um, so they could you know, power the whole two cities of Portland uh, 
on one of these farms and they are at under natural gas prices. Um, we do have to pay transmission costs, um, which might add a penny to transmit that electricity over the lines to get there. But uh, this is, um, as I say, real business. Um, another f interesting fact is with solar, it's about three times and wind, four times the number of employees per installed megawatt compared to a gas plant. So instead of spending that money on, the, on uh, a lot of the fuel, you are actually hiring regular people and the typical operator is, is kind of a uh, auto mechanic that you've trained to be a technician. So you are, in my view, spending uh, money hiring people uh, rather than sending it to a very uh, consolidated group in the uh, uh, gas business. Now I agree, gas also employs people, but it's much more concentrated uh, in how you're dispersing that money compared to uh, a broader array of jobs. All right, let's shift a little bit. Um, Latin and South America, this is the new hot market. So my company has an office in Chile, uh, in Rio, uh, and Mexico, and uh, these, this area is in quite a ways, shall we say, uh, behind uh, our country, U.S. Please know, the United States has been a real leader in renewable energy. We've got a lot of firsts. Uh, we're being absolutely left behind and in the dirt, but we have been very much of a leader, both on technology and uh, installation. And uh, kudos to uh, um, Governor George Bush in uh, some really innovative policies in Texas that uh, put forth so much uh, wind power and now solar power uh, in that state. And uh, his administration also passed a push uh, for a significant amount of 20% uh, of uh, our energy in the whole country uh, from uh, wind and solar power uh, that he set as a goal through that, uh, the Bush administration, George Bush. So in Latin America, I think just the takeaway is um, their actual 20, uh, uh, gigawatts and look what they're trying to uh, forecast to install. So you can look at some of the uh, increased percentage of the current installed capacity uh, in to 2020. Uh, so this is obviously why we're down there and why so much activity uh, especially in Chile, uh, Panama, Mexico, Argentina. Argentina has now become stable enough. People are willing to invest in it. It's uh, gotten its markets back together. Just that's really pretty new news in the last uh, year and a half. Uh, Brazil's a little bit sleepy at the moment. They're still coming out of their recession, but uh, we're going to see a lot more activity. Mexico uh, is really putting an aggressive point, and a lot of the basis for it is is renewable energy is really. Um, Its biggest ingredient is money. And so cost of capital is the biggest uh, differentiator on how much renewable energy you're gonna to wanna to install. So in our current uh, low cost capital, we've got mortgages at what, four and a half percent or three and a half percent. It's a great time to borrow low cost money and uh, install uh, renewable energy and infrastructure. Whereas 10, 15 years ago, you had much higher capital costs. Just a few uh, more uh, wind on the left and solar here, and just giving you some idea of uh, what's going on in these markets. These are some fairly large numbers. Um, I'm using a different uh, metric uh, back to investors. Uh, so now we're in EMEA, Europe, Middle East, Africa. So we've gone from Latin and South America across. You can see the countries on the left. And what we're looking at is the equity returns. So these are the fat cats who have all their billions and millions and they're trying to figure out where they can get the most secure and highest return on their dollars. And renewable energy continues to be a really attractive investment. Uh, last week I was in Midtown Manhattan at the Renewable Energy Finance Forum. It's where all the big investors uh, come, 200 people together, and they talk about all the complex uh, financial models, uh, tax equity deals, uh, mezzanine debt, all the tricks of a trade that as an engineer I still try to learn, but uh, it's pretty interesting, all the models. 
Um, and uh, by the way, there's also a continued discussion on uh, yield codes and other methods in order to allow the public to buy, for example, a fund that directly invested in. So you could spend $1,000 and be a partial owner to a wind farm and how you get in there. And uh, the disappointment that while it's a great vehicle, some people had gone in too aggressively, too fast, and they f didn't fail, but they did not pan out. And one large company, um, which is a local issue here, Sun Edison, Sun Edison bought First Wind. First Wind, a familiar name of a wind developer here in Portland. Sun Edison bought them. They completely overextended, uh, spent uh, about $800 million on buying a bunch of wind turbines and then failed to place those turbines into service and couldn't make the debt payments and they went under. So um, why I, I, I put this up here is if you look in the countries, now here are the players, there's the developer, the private equity uh, entity, um, this is in the utility and larger institutional investors might be a big insurance company um, that has uh, all this money that they're investing and trying to keep it going or could actually be a, a pension fund, teachers retirement funds. And in this case, you can see where the risk is. So obviously South Africa, they're earning more money because it's higher risk uh, and Kenya and other places. And you can uh, just get a, another idea of where um, Germany is interesting because it's so well known. Renewable energy is so well understood. It's such a strong uh, defined business that uh, the risks are low so you don't get very much money for it. So you have to go to other markets. The takeaway again is uh, it's a very active market. Uh, there's uh, this year alone in the United States, one bank, Key Bank, based in Ohio, um, their uh, managing director said last week that they will be placing uh, anywhere between 2.5 and $3 billion in wind and solar in 2017. Um, and if you think about the money in your uh, checking account or, or savings, you'd be pretty happy if you could get uh, a return. And these are returns that are uh, backed up by a 20-year power purchase agreement. They're really pretty secure. This is not volatile stuff that's going to uh, run around. Um, these numbers are pretty solid. New market that's really, uh, uh, we just won two jobs in Egypt, interestingly enough. Uh, a lot of excitement in the solar field. Uh, Turkey is another market that's uh, on the move. Um, Spain, Italy, and the UK had some very um, aggressive uh, obligations, renewable obligation. We in this country, call them RPS, Renewable Portfolio Standards. So in the case of Massachusetts, they just passed a policy that uh, requests 1,600 megawatts of renewable energy for Massachusetts. So they're requiring <coughs> their utility to get 1,600 megawatts of renewable energy, uh, or else if they don't, they get penalized uh, for it. So you're seeing a uh, push for 400 megawatts of offshore and then they're looking at bringing in hydropower down from uh, Hydro-Quebec and that's the discussions you hear on um, what's the New Hampshire transmission line and there's now a transmission line through the bottom of Lake Champlain coming in. Uh, so these are all the wrestling based on these various policies and market trends. Uh, the point is not, to, I'm sorry I'm using one of our company slides but uh, these are the projects we're involved in. My reason for including it is just to give you an idea of some of the things going on. Uh, a lot of work on the uh, Somali-Kenyan border where there's so much unrest uh, coming in is to look at uh, wind and solar uh, to keep people in the villages because you're displacing high cost diesel fuel. Um, I was doing a fair amount of work in Somaliland two years ago where the uh, uh, cost of electricity is $1.15 per kilowatt hour. Remember, we're 15 cents, they're $1.15. And they've got this awesome resource. They've got the cool one of a six and a half, seven sun hour sun resource and an excellent wind resource uh, through there. But uh, right next to my project is an old MIG jet all filled with bullet holes. 
and they don't bother to change the oil, they don't bother to think about things because when I ask some of the 30 year olds who were involved in the clashes in the war, they say, why should we bother to fix it? It's just gonna get blown up. So uh, I've been over to the to commission to wind farm and I've been back to repair it and now it's broken again because no one wants to maintain it. Um, uh, a lot of really great work going on in uh, South Africa, uh, Nigeria. Uh, we're doing a big project in Ghana right now. Uh, Africa is a big uh, region uh, for uh, growth and you saw the uh, expected return on equity and that's why the money's going down there. But I think it's also interesting if you look at South Africa <coughs> where this is uh, levelized in uh, dollars per megawatt. So we're still at uh, six cents, four cents. These are still the numbers uh, for auctions so that the developer has to bid into the market and says, I'm willing to give you electricity at this price, just uh, like a normal auction. So these aren't uh, super high prices, but uh, that's to me another example of <coughs> renewable energy is successful. Uh, the utilities are buying it, the prices are low, and they are not going down the oil path. They are choosing renewable energy. Um, back to the Caribbean, there's a very large utility, another local name, Amera. Ring a bell, Amera's a utility around here. So they, uh, their development model is they buy utilities in the Caribbean. So they bought, they run the concession in Barbados, uh, Grand Bahama, uh, uh, Dominique, a uh, couple others. And the uh, head of Amera said, no more no diesels. We're not going to consider natural gas. We're only doing uh, solar and possibly wind uh, because that's most secure. They can mo make the most money on it. Uh, and it's got the least risk. And they don't have to deal with all the other issues of infrastructure. All they've got to do is find some land and bring it in. And now they're really moving hard. I'm working with... Uh, Amera in Grand Bahama on battery storage and also um, flywheels. And the idea of the flywheel is when you have the cloud coming over your solar panel that's down here and that cloud may cover the solar panel for five seconds, ten seconds, and that power on that solar panel, what's it do? With the cloud coming over. So all you got to do is just hold that energy for Typically what we're finding is anywhere between six to 13 seconds is all we need. So we don't need a big massive hours of storage. We just need to bridge through to bring that intermittent technology to a useful form. I had to uh, put this in. So uh, we were the technical advisor for Google. Uh, Google bought uh, one third of the um, Lake Turkana wind farm, which is at the very top of Kenya. It's a $120 million investment um, and is the largest wind farm, uh, 310 megawatts in uh, the continent of Africa. And uh, I just love these guys' jackets. This is the security guys. He's got his gun in his hand. Um, he's got another gun here and we'll blow you away with a wind turbine there. And uh, I just thought that was a great security guard coat. They love them. Um, and these are Turkanans. Um, uh, I mean, around the corner are folks with uh, those uh, necklaces stacked to extend their necks, and they don't know that there's a, a, a world out there. Um, we're talking complete uh, back uh, remote uh, Kenya. Uh, you still buy a bride with camels, and um, they uh, spent, as you can imagine, Google spent a lot of time considering the social impacts. How could they ensure that the truck drivers uh, we changed the route of the truck drivers bringing the turbines in, wind turbines in, so that they wouldn't be near villages for fear of AIDS and other uh, issues and keeping things separate. Um, so it's, it's uh, just now getting commissioned. It's a four-year project. It's an interesting example of trying to bring in appropriate technology. Uh, we've been owner's engineer uh, in Mongolia. We're now on the second wind farm, but uh, these are uh, Chinese wind turbines uh, brought up. Uh, from China, uh, made by GE, General Electric, 1.6 megawatts. And uh, the, at the border, because the Mongolians and Chinese don't uh, get along, they have a whole bunch of armed guards lined up, and the trucks stop, and the Chinese drivers get out of the trucks, 
and go one way, and then the Mongolian drivers get in the trucks, and then you continue driving to site. It's a uh, 2,000 kilometer trip, and you can see uh, some of the tower sections coming across. Uh, uh, this is in uh, middle to northern Mongolia. The one we're doing right now is in the Gobi Desert. Gives you some of the scale of the blades. And this is a fairly small, this is a 1.6 megawatt with about a uh, 95, 90, yeah, 95 meter rotor, tip to tip. And uh, down in Curacao, I mentioned the island there, those are 3.5 megawatts, so double the size in rating, and they have a 117 meter uh, rotor. So coming back to this country and a little bit closer, uh, Block Island is now in the water. It's uh, met COD. So this is a small 30 megawatt project uh, off our coast uh, of Rhode Island. Um, the whole basis is that this would enable them to leapfrog the larger projects. It was just a month ago they signed a 90 megawatt, so triple the size power purchase agreement just south of this wind farm, and it's going to allow them to run a transmission cable into Montauk on the east end of Long Island. And you could imagine the difficulty of running transmission from out west, or excuse me, northern New York, down through New York City to get power to Long Island. So it's another uh, benefit of offshore wind because you've got an easy way to bring that uh, transmission cable right in uh, to where the demand is. Um, these projects are in anywhere from 20 to 25 meters uh, depth. Um, pretty classic uh, foundation style. These wind turbines are six megawatts. So these are big machines, six megawatt rated. Uh, and I think you're gonna see more of those. Uh, coming closer, we have the uh, University of Maine project, um, MAV, to build two Loading. So this one's fixed. So these are fixed uh, to the bottom. And then the University of Maine and Chinbro and Amera Consortium are uh, pushing forward to put two machines off uh, south of Monhegan. And the idea is to demonstrate a particular style of floating technology. It's a concrete foundation uh, or float buoyancy that floats below the surface. And then the tower of the turbine is uh, coming up. This is called the transition piece because really from about here up is just a standard wind turbine with some marine uh, paint, uh, but otherwise it's about the same. So the idea with University of Maine and the MAV consortium is can their foundation technology, is it cheaper, uh, better, because you're not gonna install a fixed foundation in deep water. In the case of a lot of areas all across the west coast, um, certain areas uh, off Long Island um, to the south and clearly Maine and uh, uh, markets in Europe and also Japan are hot markets for deep water wind. So the only way to do it there is floating. You might recall hearing the term high wind or stat oil. This is when Governor LePage uh, did something pretty shocking in uh, that he rescinded a signed contract that the uh, uh, Public Utilities Commission of Maine signed a power purchase agreement with stat oil to put in a demonstration project, and he felt that the MAV project, or I'm not sure what he felt, I would never say that. So um, anyways, the outcome was that he yanked the contract, and Statoil, which is a monster uh, company, uh, oil group based in Norway, uh, just said goodbye uh, and left. They now put their project, that same project, in Scotland. Uh, I bring them up because they're probably one of the leaders on floating offshore technology. So in effect, the MAV main project is competing with Statoil and who's gonna have the better technology? Does it make sense? Can you bring the cost down? So speaking of costs, uh, offshore wind power is still more expensive, obviously, uh, but it's coming down rapidly. The, these, this project in Block Island, I think the power purchase agreement is about 23 cents a kilowatt hour. So we've gone from those four numbers and, and some of the solar numbers at 18, 19, we're up at 23. And now in Europe, some of the current projects have been bidding in around nine cents, nine and 10 cents. And uh, the South Fork project, I don't recall the actual number, but it's significantly less than Block Island. Um, 
So, ready for your imagination? You, you got Maine, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, New York, uh, New, New, New Jersey, Maryland, Delaware, all the way down. So that's the coast. And there is a whole a set of approximately uh, eight leases that companies such as Statoil, um, I mentioned uh, Deepwater Wind, they're the developer for Block Island. Um, uh, Avant Grid, there's a local uh, name now here in Maine, uh, as you know, uh, Ibadrola and Scottish Power, the big uh, European utilities bought uh, Central Maine Power and uh, they've came up, what's their name? Yeah, Avant Grid. So they have gone out to the BOEM, uh, Bureau of Offshore Energy and Mines, which is a federal entity that is in charge of the continental shelf and administering that. And the BOEM has put areas up for lease. So there's a public auction and the highest bidder uh, meeting all uh, certain criteria bid to have access and lease a set of um, um, area out on the ocean and then they would go and develop an offshore wind farm. So Statoil won a lease off of Fire Island, south of uh, Long Island. Um, uh, Deepwater uh, just won a big lease down in Maryland. There's another group called US Wind. Um, interestingly, in Maryland, they require, instead of a uh, renewable portfolio standard, they have a thing called OREC, which is Offshore Renewable Energy um, Credit. So you have to prove that you're going to hire people in the state, sounds familiar, you know, build industry, do things there, and benefit the state by having um, your uh, project there. Uh, I think that the offshore business in the United States is still nascent, uh, still yet to, to see, but the benefits of, uh, this is one of our densest population all along the East Coast, the area along what's called the PGM uh, transmission sector in New Jersey and Delaware and Pennsylvania and Connecticut, uh, that whole southern part of New York is so thick with people, infrastructure, and transmission. The ability to have a grid along the east, eastern seaboard and have capacity factors of some 50 and 60 percent capacity factor similar to this Curacao wind farm, whereas a wind farm in Maine is running at about 35 to 40 percent capacity factor um, and have it easily brought in through the mud in a cable and uh, right into your substation in, into New York and uh, Washington and all along, I think is a pretty significant benefit. Um, and you will see offshore coming. Uh, you will see the prices continue to come down like uh, so many of the other um, graphs uh, throughout. Lots of storage technologies, lots of names, Tesla, other kinds of things that uh, we've been going through. You're going to see a lot more. A couple of uh, points from our industry when uh, 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 the current administration wants to cut uh, the Office of Energy and Renewables 79, uh, 72%. Um, Rick Perry, uh, this is just two weeks ago. Uh, has come up with a really interesting method to benefit coal and that, that is to require all generation plants to have 30 days of energy storage on site and you're not going to have natural gas plants put in tanks on site. They get their fuel through pipelines. So this is their method to uh, combat uh, the uh, renewable energy field and the natural gas field and support what they talked about with coal. Uh, from my point of view, that means they're picking on the natural gas lobby, and I have a feeling the natural gas lobby is pretty powerful um, and will not allow that to move along. A um, couple of other uh, points to finish on, on that one is uh, I thought it's interesting of one of the largest utilities in the United States, uh, Ralph Izzo, uh, and you can read his comment. Utilities love renewables. Uh, it's really helped them. They haven't had to invest in it. Someone else, remember the private equity investing in it, and they're getting this low-cost energy. Their clients like it because it's clean, and it's producing a lot of jobs. Uh, I think this is another interesting point that uh, our Beijing office is growing significantly, uh, continues to, to push away. That's where uh, that country's going. And then here's just another point on uh, solar. 
imagine the United States, California, and uh, the East. So I had talked about having uh, offshore wind here because not many people want a big, huge grid coming from the wind of the middle of the country going right through their backyard. And the cost of that coming all the way, this is literally, we're talking uh, Wyoming, Oklahoma, Kansas, coming all the way through here. It's also a political fight because the eastern governors want the activity and the business and the manufacturing in your state. You don't want to be sending your money out west uh, to buy this electricity. You want to generate it locally in the jobs, which is so much of a, a classic foundation and just like everything in our world, it's, it's all about money and uh, it's uh, all about how people want to do things. So uh, why we're seeing such an explosion of renewable energy around the world uh, and I feel a lot of the free market economies is because they may not have access to equity uh, money. The governments typically don't have access to money unless they're getting low cost uh, financing uh, from China who's trying to have, shall I say, hook them in to say if, we'll give you money if you buy our products. Uh, and Europe has really scaled down on that. The United States has scaled down on that. You heard the hubbub about the Exim Bank. Uh, last year to shut down the XM Bank, which tends to subsidize U.S. manufacturers. So GE, which is a large wind turbine manufacturer, works to get low-cost subsidized financing to go into Africa or Poland, Turkey, and these other ideas to, to bring in U.S. products. So uh, from the, those types of points, and now the Paris uh, Accords and, and other news for us, uh, on a worldwide basis, it's very uh, disappointing because it takes us out of the regular activity and interchange. I would say on a local basis the good news is we make uh, decisions on a state level so really while the White House can make a lot of noise on policy most all of these renewable portfolio standards, Massachusetts offshore policy, uh, these different efforts that are going on out west, uh, the Texas uh, story, uh, California is going to quadruple their amount of photovoltaics in the next few years. Those are all based on absolute in-state uh, policy uh, that are continuing to drive renewables forward uh, and hire people. And uh, it's all based on classic lobbying and politics of the, the businesses in those states. So I'm still uh, upbeat. I'm uh, feeling like we lost a lot of progress uh, with the current uh, administration because uh, uh, there was so much excitement. Uh, in 2008, the American Wind Energy Association annual big conference in Chicago had 22,000 people. This year, a month ago, in um, Anaheim, California, 6,000. So, uh, uh, yeah, business is still going. We're still doing things, but uh, things are not uh, upbeat and uh, moving forward. I'm, I'm going to wrap up, so questions. Well, uh, if I could, because it relates to the uh, project you were talking about in Ohio, I just set myself a quick alert to uh, learn more about um, what you were speaking of. And the, one of the results that came back just a few minutes ago, they announced $4.2 billion wind stymied in Ohio. Uh, the House refuses to ease restrictive zoning. So they're, they're putting a stranglehold on 4.2 billion dollars worth of economic development and infrastructure investments. Uh, I guess out of spite, I'm not sure exactly why, but is that the project uh, that you were making reference to earlier in your uh, presentation? Um, thank you, and the, my reference was that there's a large bank in Ohio. Okay, and I was wondering if they were the ones that were funded. I'm sure they have some stake in it. Yeah. just remarkable to me that, you know, uh, you have this kind of development potential and then it's throttled back by uh, an administration that uh, <laughs> really doesn't want new development. <laughs> it's pretty common. Yeah. It's uh, been a, a long, uh, back, you know, fighting this industry with getting, uh, dispelling mist, you know, uh, more birds are killed with by cars and plate glass windows and all of these and cats 
uh, but people love to pick on wind turbines. Um, you know, there's all these things that uh, go out there, and we, just in all of the work we do, have to make sure we go find the right information uh, and get grounded on it. Are there any concerns about the changes in the land resource of climate change? And Absolutely. Yeah. No, that's a, uh, one of our clients buying a large portfolio down in Latin America was asked us to really look into what would be the difference on a, a changing of the El uh, Nino and uh, El Nino change and would it shift. Um, so you banks be a mechanism to help with some of the financing or is that kind of different? Yes, yeah, so green banks, um, not familiar, are uh, private, public, quasi uh, entities. New York's got a really uh, strong one, and uh, they've gone out and raised a, a variety of different uh, monies, types of money, in order to inst and push on policies so that the green bank is taking what the state policy is and really saying, okay, that's the goal, then let's help finance to reach those goals. So that would be different than, like, say, the nuclear power plant risk that you were talking about, like a federally subsidized. Yeah, totally different. Because these are the green banks are a cause, are first of all state and private, so they're run more by a, a, a board. To build for a federal one, but I, yeah, they may. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Good luck. <laughs> uh, can you envision the day when? Um, the U.S. is 100% renewable uh, generated, or are we always going to be dependent on some fossil fuels? Um, well, I'm going to. So I'll answer the questions. No, I don't see it uh, on uh, dependent on fossil fuels. Uh, I'm not answering the question right. Here's what I see. Let me try it back. Uh, no, I don't see it 100% renewable, but I do see that we have it on. Um, uh, renewable energy and possibly uh, fusion and some other uh, types of storage mechanisms and other things. I, did, I see that fossil fuel will probably price itself out of the market. At some point, we'll start to deal with the externalities and the cleanup costs and the insurance companies. And I will count on the, the free market will drive us toward uh, a more secure. One of the, another reason why renewable energy is so popular is this CFO, if I may, uh, in the companies, they love the predictability because once you lock that cost of capital in, you're not dealing with volatile prices. I can predict that. So these are the kinds of things that I think will win uh, over. Um, so that's why you're going to see uh, some other things. As I say, it won't be 100% renewable, but you'll see other technologies come in and we'll use fossil fuels for peaking or other certain uh, good uses of them. I was at Purdue University about 15 years ago and took a tour of their power plant there that is a coal burning plant, but that's on crushed gravel or something, so there's zero carbon. Um, but apparently that technology hasn't, uh, hasn't caught on. Would you, would you know about that or is it just that the costs are too high? Well, there's some push on, on clean coal, which is sequestering the carbon. So they're trying to, uh, they're still carbon. It's this normal cycle of using coal to heat uh, ste create steam, use and turn the turbine and generate electricity, but then they're driving the emissions down in and trying to bring it back into some uh, underground stored of uh, the, the carbon uh, cycle. So I don't know about that particular project, but it's one of those uh, ideas that was actually on my, my chart of people fooling around with, uh, but the costs are still astronomical. You know, back to my point on not running out of energy, there's wild stuff going out there, algae and, and all kinds of things that are, are happening. The question is, when do they hit uh, the ability? Uh, just like I, I like to say when people say, oh, you work in the alternative energy field, I say, no, no, we're mainstream. Uh, look at those prices. We're renewable energy, but those other ones are alternative and we'll, they'll come along. We'll see lots more electricity. We're going to move so much closer to electricity with smart grid, with the idea of these uh, battery packages and solar panels and uh, plug-in hybrids. So you plug your car in when you 
uh, uh, come in and then the utility can use. If we had 10,000 plug-in uh, hybrids all around the region and the utility could balance those rather than turning on another generator, that operator would say, I'm going to use those folks' cars for the next 20 minutes and see if I can get by without bringing on more energy. Um, so that's the, the dream and the, the intent of Smart Grid. Uh, we'll see lots and lots. If I were 23 again right now, um, whereas when I was, renewable energy is like, yeah, that's cool. I would be all about smart grid and battery storage. To me, it's just fascinating all the technology and uh, new things that are coming up. Some of the simple things that are happening too. Uh, Green Mountain Power in Vermont just announced that they're, they have a program where they're, uh, in a sense, controlling your water heater and using that as a place to put energy. Yeah. So they're able to uh, control it without making any changes in your lifestyle. Uh, you're able to sort of, they're thinking outside the box. They're really doing some very creative um, work up there, so. Okay, enough, more? Great, thank you so much, Thank you. Thank you.